Hello and welcome to the online lecture on mechanical ventilation. Let's start with a definition. Mechanical ventilation aims to replace or augment the bellows function or ventilation of the lungs, inspiration and expiration, using preset values adjusting for the rate, volume, pressure, and oxygen that the lungs would normally maintain in order to achieve a dynamic equilibrium or changing balance of gas exchange. The overarching goal is end organ perfusion. Let's dissect the definition of mechanical ventilation a little further. The lungs function as a bellows, working with the relationship between pressure and volume. I've provided a picture of a bellows as a reminder as to what that is. I've also provided a basic image of the lung with some key anatomical features. On inspiration, the diaphragm relaxes and intercostals contract. This decreases intrathoracic pressure, resulting in a negative pressure environment. Because of this, air flows into the lungs. On expiration, the diaphragm contracts and intercostals relax. This produces an increased intrathoracic pressure, resulting in a positive pressure environment where air is forced out of the lungs. The function of expiration requires elastic recoil, often referred to as compliance. Ventilation can be said to be proportional to compliance plus resistance. Compliance refers to the lung tissue and alveoli and is associated with surface tension of the alveoli related to surfactant and the connective tissue of the lungs, which establishes elastic recoil. Compliance is further defined as a change in volume over a change in pressure. Pressure and volume are inversely proportional meaning when you have an increased pressure, you have a decreased volume, and when you have a decreased pressure, you have an increased volume. Resistance, on the other hand, refers to the airways and is primarily a function of the radius of the airway. Because of the underlying pathology, the lungs are unable to maintain the pressure gradient to allow flow of an adequate volume. The ventilator will take control of this pressure gradient Mechanical ventilation is indicated in any condition that significantly alters ventilation or oxygenation or places the patient at a significant risk thereof. In a shunt, there's adequate ventilation with inadequate perfusion. In other words, air is getting to the alveolocapillary membrane but is having difficulty crossing into the bloodstream. A shunt can be intracardiac for instance with any of the cardiac shunts discussed in the pediatric cardiology lecture, or interpulmonary, for instance with acute respiratory distress syndrome or pulmonary hypertension. With dead space, there's inadequate ventilation with adequate perfusion. In other words, air is not getting to the alveolocapillary membrane for some reason, but there's no problem with the bloodstream. With hypoventilation, Think about the mechanics that allow for ventilation. There may be decreased drive, for instance with central nervous system disease, overdose, or anesthesia. There may be neuromuscular disease, for instance with ALS, Guillain-Barre syndrome, myasthenia gravis, or muscular dystrophy. Or there may be a chest wall or pleural disease, for instance kyphoscoliosis, massive effusion, or pneumothorax. With diffusion abnormality, there's a problem in the alveolocapillary membrane, and the most common issue here is pulmonary fibrosis. With imbalanced oxygen supply or demand, think about conditions that allow for movement and utilization of oxygen. For instance, problems in cardiac output, problems with hemoglobin, or problems at the cellular level with perfusion. For instance, your distributive shock states. One of the most important assessment tools engaging the need and response to mechanical ventilation is the arterial blood gas. Although sources may vary slightly, the normal ranges for each parameter are provided here. A working knowledge of the ABG is essential in any setting where you may deal with problems of oxygenation and ventilation. This is a simplified method for determining acid-base status. We know that the PaCO2 refers to respiratory and the HCO3 or bicarb refers to metabolic. List the values pH, PaCO2, and HCO3. 
Beside each value, write alternating A's for acid and B's for base, as shown here. Add the normal value range under each A and B, as shown here. If you can remember 35 and 45, you can easily recall the pH and the PaCO2. Next, look at your patient's ABG and plot the pH. Are they acidotic or alkalotic? Next, plot the patient's PaCO2 and the bicarb and ask yourself which value is most off. Match the values to determine if the patient's in respiratory or metabolic acidosis or alkalosis. Keep in mind the mnemonic ROM, respiratory opposite, metabolic equal, meaning that in respiratory problems, the values are in opposition, for instance, a low pH and a high PaCO2 indicating respiratory acidosis. In metabolic problems, the values are moving in the same direction, for instance, a high pH and a high bicarb indicating metabolic alkalosis. With this in mind, we are primarily concerned with the PaCO2 and PaO2 in mechanical ventilation. These values illuminate two important concepts within lung mechanics, ventilation and oxygenation. Underneath each of these concepts, I've included the mechanical ventilation variables that correspond with each. We will discuss the less obvious ones in more detail. These values are important because if there's a change in PaCO2, there's a problem in ventilation, in which case, with a low PaCO2 and a high pH, you would decrease the rate or the tidal volume. With a high PaCO2 and a low pH, you would increase the rate or the tidal volume. On the other hand, a change in PaO2 indicates a problem in oxygenation. For instance, with a low PaO2, you would increase FiO2 or PEEP. And with a high PaO2, you would decrease the FiO2 or PEEP. Let's apply these principles and look at them in a little bit more detail. On this spectrum, I've divided oxygenation and ventilation with corresponding oxygenation or ventilation modalities. The nasal cannula, face mask or venti mask, and non-rebreather target oxygenation only. Methods of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, such as the CPAP, BiPAP, and high flow nasal cannula, or methods of invasive positive pressure ventilation, such as the endotracheal tube with mechanical ventilation, target both oxygenation and ventilation. So with FiO2, there are some complications associated with raising it. For instance, an increase in FiO2 results in the formation of reactive oxygen species, which can lead to mitochondrial dysfunction and rupture of cells. An increase in FiO2 can also result in a decrease in nitric oxide in the lungs. Because nitric oxide is one of the components maintaining open alveoli, alveoli can collapse, resulting in absorption atelectasis, which forms a shunt, which may contribute to hypoxemia. Positive end expiratory pressure, or PEEP, is the positive pressure maintained at the end of expiration. This results in an increase in the functional residual capacity, or in other words, the functional component of the alveolus after exhalation. Increasing the FRC results in increased surface area, prevention of collapse, decreased intrapulmonary shunting, improved compliance, and improved oxygenation. The benefits of this is because of the increased surface area for diffusion and decreased shunting, a lower FiO2 is needed, and thus there's less risk of oxygen toxicity. The positive pressure associated with increasing FRC may decrease transudation of fluids such as with CHF. And finally, an increased compliance results in a decrease in work of breathing. Physiological PEEP is around 5, which is often what you set the ventilator to be. This pressure maintains continued oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange despite full exhalation. Two very common oxygenation modalities that augment PEEP and the increase in FRC are CPAP and BiPAP. With CPAP, the setting that's established is the PEEP, and it maintains a constant opening of the airways at the end of expiration. This is used primarily in obstructive sleep apnea, where the patient obstructs during their sleep, but maintaining this constant pressure maintains an open airway. With BiPAP, there are two settings. One of the settings is PEEP, maintaining that baseline openness of the airways, 
The other setting is pressure support, which gives an additional boost of pressure to maintain open airways. This is often used in COPD to help blow off CO2, but is never used in asthma because of the risk of barotrauma. So to kind of summarize, the benefit of CPAP and BiPAP is the increase in FRC, which results in more alveolar recruitment, more surface area, and more diffusion of oxygen. Because of this, a higher PEEP allows for lower FiO2. However, PEEP is not all good. It comes with some complications. PEEP can overdistend more compliant lung units, contributing to ventilator-induced lung injury or VLI. Overdistension results in augmentation of dead space, an increase in pulmonary vascular resistance, it can cause right-sided heart dysfunction, and it can decrease venous return, resulting in decreased cardiac output. This should be used cautiously in increased intracranial pressure and cardiovascular collapse. Just to clarify, PEEP can decrease venous return because of the increase in intrathoracic pressure. That increase in pressure essentially squeezes the inferior and superior vena cava. Because of this, there's a lower preload, which ultimately translates to a decrease in cardiac output. So a lot of times, initially, whenever you place a patient on PEEP, you'll see a transient decrease in blood pressure. However, this should be monitored as it should not continue. So we've discussed FiO2 and PEEP. The remaining variables are relatively straightforward. Tidal volume, abbreviated VT, focuses on the volume of air the patient receives. Pressure support, abbreviated PS, is the pressure the patient receives. And the respiratory rate, or RR, is simply the rate at which the patient is set to breathe. Hopefully these values are beginning to make sense. If you want more oxygenation, or PaO2, you can increase the amount of oxygen the patient receives by the FiO2, or you can increase the functional portion of the lung at end expiration by increasing PEEP. If I want more ventilation, I could give the patient more volume or pressure or increase the respiratory rate. Let's now focus on what we can do with the endotracheal tube. I put together this simple image dividing two major classifications of things we can do with the ventilator. On the assist side, we can set the ventilator to perform BiPAP, CPAP, or T-piece. I'll mention here that the T-piece refers to tube compensation only allowing the practitioner to determine if the patient is able to wean. All of these modes on the assist side have no set rate and give the patient a little bit more control, just with some assistance. On the control side, there is always a set rate. You can control for pressure, volume, or bi-level, which integrates features of both pressure and volume control. Control settings are used for the patient with acute pathology who need a little more than just some assistance with ventilation. In this image, I've divided up the most common modes of ventilation. Volume control assist control involves a set mandatory respiratory rate, a set volume, is patient or time triggered, and the patient is free to breathe over the settings. Pressure control assist control is very similar to BCAC, but controls for pressure instead of volume. Synchronized Intermittent Mandatory Ventilation, or SIMV, has the same features of VCAC and PCAC, but can control for either pressure or volume. On the bottom, PEEP is as we have described, and on the other side we have pressure support. Pressure support is patient-triggered and is a common weaning method. In the middle of PEEP and pressure support, I've included the two modes that integrate both features of these variables. CPAP and BiPAP, as we have described. Here I've provided a table that integrates some of the advantages and disadvantages of some of the modes. The one mode I did not discuss is Controlled Mechanical Ventilation, or CMV. This mode is not used as frequently in practice anymore because it essentially takes total control of ventilation. This is a problem because of a basic physiologic principle. If you don't use it, you lose it. Let's go through each of the ventilator variables again with the addition of usual settings on the ventilator. The respiratory rate is often set at 12 to 16 breaths per minute. Note, however, that an increase in rate increases ventilation but also increases dead space. Dead space is that air that's not being utilized through perfusion, 
and usually it's around 150 milliliters with each breath. Tidal volume is as we've described, the volume of gas with each breath. It's usually set at six to eight milliliters per kilogram of ideal body weight and usually ranges between 500 and 600 milliliters. An increase in tidal volume will increase ventilation with less dead space. Flow rate is not used quite as commonly and is the max flow delivered during inspiration. This is often set if it's used to 60 or more liters per minute. With FiO2, the goal is to set the lowest possible FiO2 necessary to meet oxygen goals, aiming for a PaO2 greater than 60 and an SpO2 greater than 90%. The higher the FiO2, the higher the PaO2 and SpO2 will be. Ventilator dead space is usually calibrated, and this refers to the circuitry or the tubing. Positive end expiratory pressure or PEEP is often set between 5 and 20 centimeters of water. It's important to note here that PEEP is used when there's a set rate and CPAP is used when there's no set rate. One of the key jobs as the bedside nurse is to monitor the patient for potential complications. Preventative measures should be implemented. For instance, with ventilator-associated pneumonia, oral care every two to four hours per institutional policy significantly reduces the risk of VAP. VTE prophylaxis with heparin or lovinox is essential in preventing clot formation, and all patients on a ventilator require a PPI such as protonics. This reduces the risk of GI bleed and ulceration. One of the best ways to remember how to manage a patient on the ventilator is through the mnemonic FAST hugs. This stands for feeding, analgesia, sedation, thromboembolism prophylaxis, head of bed elevation, usually at 30 to 45 degrees, ulcer prophylaxis, and I didn't mention on the previous slide, but mechanical ventilation greater than or equal to 48 hours is a risk factor, glucose control, and spontaneous breathing trials and sedation vacation. Another important aspect of ventilator management at the bedside is recognition and response to ventilator alarms. In the beginning of this lecture, we discussed the two variables associated with ventilation, compliance and resistance. These two variables come into play when analyzing ventilator alarms. On the mechanical ventilator, a waveform similar to the one here will be displayed. The baseline of this waveform is the positive end expiratory pressure. When the patient takes a breath, Pressure rises displaying a peak inspiratory pressure, or PIP. This is the pressure needed to overcome airway resistance and distend the lung. The delta pressure is the pressure needed to overcome airway resistance, whereas the plateau pressure, often abbreviated P-plat, is the pressure needed to distend the lungs. The plateau pressure corresponds with lung compliance. When a high pressure alarm goes off, the pressure is between 10 and 15 centimeters of water above the set peak inspiratory pressure range. The question is, is it a problem with delta or plateau pressure? This can be determined by looking at the waveform. Issues with delta pressure include bronchospasm or bronchoconstriction, secretions or mucus plugging, endotracheal tube or circuitry kinking or biting, or asynchronous breathing. Issues with plateau pressure include pneumothorax, pulmonary edema, acute respiratory distress syndrome, pneumonia, CHF, pulmonary hemorrhage, and pleural effusion. With a low pressure alarm, which is usually five to 10 centimeters of water below the set peak inspiratory pressure, there's usually an inability to build up airway pressure because of a disconnection or a leak, or it could also indicate a change in compliance or resistance. In managing ventilator alarms, always respond immediately. Note the alarm sounding, look at the patient, look at the system, and troubleshoot. If you can't fix the alarm quickly, disconnect the ventilator and use the Ambu bag. If the patient is difficult to ventilate, then there's a problem with the patient. If the patient is easy to ventilate, then there's a problem with the ventilator. In terms of weaning or liberation from the ventilator, there are certain parameters. The patient must have acceptable arterial blood gas findings and SpO2. There should be no evidence of acute pulmonary pathology. They should be hemodynamically stable. And the patient should be awake and cooperative and displays optimal respiratory drive. 
Essentially, the pathology that led to the need for mechanical ventilation should be resolved. The most common modes for weaning include SIMV and pressure support. Patients receiving mechanical ventilation should undergo daily spontaneous awakening trials with spontaneous breathing trials. This movement has resulted in improved liberation from the mechanical ventilator. Obviously, there are safety mechanisms in place as not all patients can undergo a daily spontaneous breathing trial. This is a coordinated effort between the nurse and the respiratory therapist, and I would encourage you to take a look at what your respective institution is doing in terms of SAT and SBT. The last thing I'll mention here is documentation of care. I provided you with a template for documentation that's essentially fill in the blank. As a final note, something I would encourage you all to do is keep a practice notebook something small that you can carry with you in practice. Ever since I was encouraged to do this, I've found it very beneficial. Obviously, you can't remember everything, and carrying around textbooks is not practical. Keeping a small practice notebook tailored to your practice is a very good way to quickly recall what you need to do in certain situations. This might be something that you would want to keep in your practice notebook if you work or float to the ICU.